I have asked the speakers to speak like auctioneers, so I hope you can uh, decipher what they're saying. We're going to try and stay on, on track, but uh, we are starting late, and I do want you to be able to eat lunch. So uh, we will uh, see what we can do on that matter. Anyway, uh, in the interest of time, rather than going to the long introduction of the various speakers, I would ask you to refer to their short bios in the program. That being said, I want to make a few corrections. Our first speaker, um, I'd like to add a few things. So I'm going to read his, his revised bio. Uh, many of you will know Mark Gagne. Uh, he's a lawyer and a mediator. Uh, has served over 12 years on the Ontario Municipal Board, as far as approval. And five years on the Conservation Review Board. Uh, prior to all of that, he uh, has been in 14 different countries, uh, including three program reviews for UNESCO's Paris headquarters. Uh, he chaired a national identity uh, industry, rather, a task force on the renovation industry. And you'll hear more about that in, in what he's uh, talking about today. Lectured on five continents, uh, has over 250 publications translated into seven languages, and has dis uh, distributed, at least been distributed by the International Union of Laws and Authorities. And uh, he's an author, and he can even shill some, uh, some books here uh, at the appropriate moment. Uh, author Canadian Home and Heritage Strategy Planning Handbook. Uh, certainly, we'll use those in our Heritage Planning course in Queens. So, I give you Mark Dunne. And um, we are going to give you an overview of, of the history of heritage. I just want to make some very quick contextual remarks. Um, there is an ongoing sense of what, how does heritage relate to history. And certainly, one of the themes of, of various speakers will be uh, the notion that heritage is an inclusive concept, but it's also a highly situated concept in our current state of mind, in our current culture. It's a way of understanding the past. It is not historical documentation. And it's how the past is viewed, how it's used, and how it's, uh, how it's determined, if you will, that is going to be very much part of what you're hearing today. The other thing that's important is the ongoing move in inheritance toward values-based uh, evaluation and policy plan, away from a focus on, on, the, on the fabric, uh, into both material and associative heritage resources, certainly including uh, multiple ways of viewing the past, often contested ways of viewing the past. So those are all things that you're going to see in various ways. The other thing is that um, we often perhaps are in the mindset that the heritage planning profession, if you want to call it that, is very young. Well, it actually isn't, but let's, here's some examples today of how old it actually is in this country and how inclusive it is, and how it blurs what we often see as hard and fast boundaries between interpretation, between um, reconstruction, uh, between uh, uh, archival documentation and surmise, all of those sorts of things. In other words, there's not a pure way forward. There's a lot, there are a lot of different ways of regarding the past and of working with it. And then the final piece, and you'll hear uh, a speaker on this, is the notion of what is currently of potential heritage value. In other words, in the future, what will be deemed of heritage significance? And it's very difficult when you're in the moment to make those determinations, but at the same time, you don't want to be like previous generations where anything Georgian or anything Victorian was considered worthless. So what is the legacy of our time that we will take forward? So with that, I will turn you over to Mark Dunne and his wonderful presentation. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to speak to you about this topic. Some old friends of mine once asked me to offer a few words. I spoke to them for six and a half hours. I have new friends now. <laughs> <laughs> for reasons of time, I'll focus on buildings and districts, not archaeology, and although documents like the standards and guidelines and toolkit are influential, my focus is mainly on statutes. In this 150th anniversary year, uh, I note that Canada's name means the place of buildings, over 10 million, valued at 2.2 trillion dollars, that's a trillion. Hundreds of thousands are of potential interest to the heritage community. For example, Canada has about three quarters of a million century homes. Ontario has over 300,000 dwellings built before 1920 and 600,000 built before 1940. 
1945. The rehab of such buildings is a national significant industry. Canadians spend about $5 billion a year on improving sanctuary homes. It's a high visibility branch of the $71 billion residential renovation industry, which is bigger than new home building. Canadians spend about $1.40 on improving existing buildings, buildings for every dollar spent on building new ones. But until the 1990s, Canada destroyed so many buildings that one-third of Canadian landfill deposits was composed of both used construction material. Today it's down to one-fifth, partly due to higher ticket fees, but it's still monotonous. Now, there was an ancient salesman who once told me, Mark, in this way, in any presentation, you get to make three points. No one remembers one. Mark, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me loud? Okay, so I should check. Well, no, is this is this on? Okay, I'll speak louder. Is this better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. His old salesman tells me, you get to make three points. And you make three points at the beginning, and you make your three points at the end. And then he said, Mark. Those are my three points. And he sat down and shut up. <laughs> so here are my three points. First, there's no such thing as a policy vacuum, even if it's a policy not to intervene. And even if there were no policy about what to do with something, there's always a policy on how to tax it. When in doubt, he, Marcus Tullius Cicero, follow the money. Second, today's policy framework for heritage is the legacy of the early 20th century, which was aggressively hostile. We're still undoing the consequences. Third, Ontario's policy framework is overtly pro-development. But that's not such a problem, because ironically, the fact that so many older buildings are in rough shape and need work plays to our advantage. Because from a policy perspective, the reuse of heritage is a form of development. Indeed, it's the quintessential sustainable development. So, where does our story start? Some people think Canadian policies on buildings are recent. They're not. Here's the house of Pierre Dugas de Mons in France, where he set up a company with investors. De Mons was chairman of the board of La Compagnie du Canada, the Canada company. And the CEO was this guy. He found it back. People forget that Canada, as we know it, was started by developers. Okay? Quebec had Canada's first town plan in 1636. Building permits date from the 1680s. The original reason was for the governor to veto construction in the line of fire of his cannon. Canada's first zoning was enacted in Louisbourg in 1721 to reserve the harbor area for port uses only, but it was repealed within a year as unfair tavern keepers. <laughs> Canada's first building code. <coughs> Canada's first building code dates from 1727. But all measurements had to be redone in 1763 when the British conquest produced Canada's first major conversion of measurement from pre-metric French feet to English feet. And that caused confusion. And one jurist wrote a scholarly article entitled L'inconvenient d'avoir deux pieds, the inconvenience of having two feet. <laughs> but this was about new construction. What about policy on what had all been? Next, please. Yes. I am not ever. Policy for what's already been built. Now, some people would think that public policy was redundant. Humanity has been repairing its buildings for millennia, and we didn't need government policy to compel these projects because it was simply cheaper to fix the darn thing than to start over. Before World War II, Canada did not have a demolition boom. 
but I'll get to that. The first demolition boom to get real attention was in 5th century Rome. The city was depopulating, but construction firms were still active. Instead of ordering expensive quarry stone for projects, they raid abandoned megastructures like the Colosseum. The Circus Maximus did a disappearing act. So, the first marriage <coughs> act was enact enacted by the Emperor Majorian in 457 AD, introducing a governmental permit system to protect important properties. Is this sounding familiar? <laughs> um, and it did help start stop the demolition at the Colosseum, which helps explain why the thing is still there at all today. In the Renaissance, Bavaria started unofficial inventories of important cultural property. Sweden launched, launched the first official inventory in 1666. However, it took another century before European states would reintroduce protective legislation, starting with Wurttemberg in 1790. In the 19th century, at the height of romantic mode, poets and others rediscovered all kinds of ancient structures which Viollet Le Duc believed in poetic license for what he called restoration. John Ruskin disagreed, calling for preservation and for Viollet Le Duc's poetic license to be revoked. Eventually, a compromise emerged, which heritage theorists called conservation. You could do certain upgrades, but they couldn't be bogus. When you roll in interior upgrades, the industry often refers to these as rehab, though it goes into different names too. Now, these terms are not synonymous today. The Ontario Heritage Act specifies that conservation, protection, and preservation of property are three distinct concepts referring to distinct activities. Most of Europe had heritage laws by the beginning of the 20th century, sometimes rolled into their planning legislation. On this side of the Charleston introduced the first historic district zoning in 1931, but there were other forces at work. In 1910, Austrian architect Adolf Loos published Ornament an Kreim. He said all previous architecture, which was ornamented, was the work of a criminal or a pathological piece. Uh, <laughs> buildings should look like this. <laughs> This was soon followed in 1914 Italy by the Manifesto of Futurist Architecture. It agreed that all previous architecture was, quote, moronic, and it deserved to be, quote, combated and despised. It should be replaced by this. A futurist became closely tied to one of their heroes, a guy named Benito Mussolini. This futurist building was named the House of Fascism. You'll recognize the minimalist approach, except when it was decorated for special occasions. <laughs> In an excellent PR move, futurist supporters outside Italy named themselves modernists, to which architectural textbooks added a prefix heroic. Their work, said one textbook, was illuminated by reason and ventilated by justice. The only genre and title to be called modern, according to some, it was the only thing worthy of being called style. This architecture, said Walter Gropius, was the supreme custodian of civilization and the source of all progress. This wasn't a matter of taste or opinion. Any dealings with any styles was a breach of the laws of design, <coughs> an act of dishonesty, and in front work. A previous architecture was, quote, a source of shame. The education of previous architects was, quote, perverted. So, to be clear, strictly in terms of architecture, here, no perverts. Here, perverts. Here, no criminals on pathological cases. Here, criminals on pathological cases. <laughs> Their prescription was architectural extermination. During World War II, the Journal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada listed buildings it most wanted to see bombed. London's Albert Hall and Regent Street were numbers one and two. 
in speech to architects, the principal of McGill University said it was, quote, a comparative misfortune in that none of the Canadian cities have yet been leveled by war, but as soon as war is finished, Canadians will wipe them out from one end of this dominion to the other in order that you may rebuild effectively, unquote. And what would this be going to look like? Here's a plan to replace central Paris with this. It was part of a vision called Esprit Nouveau. In 1939, the New York World's Fairs offered its vision of what a city should look like. It was called Futurama. Downtowns would be all redeveloped with modernist high rises, woven together with freeways and parking lots. Futurama was presented by General Motors. <laughs> the Journal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada published this illustration of the House of the Future. For all Canadians, it would have to be a prefab cube uh, using that quintessential modern material, plastic. If consumers worried that the plastic is combustible or gets cold, the journal replied that it would be made of the very best materials, a plasticized combination of asbestos and urea from <laughs> that unless industrial civilization routinely threw away most of its assets, society would inevitably encounter periods of oversupply and economic catastrophe. That theory was later given a name by Time magazine, Planned Obsolescence, repudiated only in 1987, as I mentioned earlier. But that view is still widely held. That one OMB here, the so-called expert, testified that buildings reach the end of their natural life in 45 years. <clears throat> so, as of the late 1930s, architects prepared to cleanse the cities of their urban past, and economists planned to support them. <coughs> Most people paid no attention. Uh, but this economist did. He despised earlier urbanization. He said it didn't symbolize industrialization. In a speech in 1938, W. Clifford Clark on the left, um, advisor to Prime Minister Mackenzie King on the right, denounced what he called the local, localized handicraft processes which characterized Canadian cities up to our time and their wasteful methods of handicraftization. Worst of all, he said, it looked like the same urbanization that, quote, catered to our forefathers before the Industrial Revolution. Clark said urban development should be mass produced, like cars. That, that was when people still model things on the car industry. But Clark was no theorist. He had the power to change the process in the most direct way possible. Money. W. Clifford Clark was a name that should be engraved on the forehead of every Canadian because he was the man who was drafted something called the Temporary Income Tax <laughs> during World War II. Clark structured it so that it ignored repairs. It presumed that buildings appreciated at breakneck speed almost as fast as cars. And he reserved the very best tax treatment of structures for demolition even better than donating the building to charity. That was partly dismantled in 1981, but only part that some of these outdated principles still underline Canada's tax system today. Ontario followed by slamming property taxes in favor of parking lots. In 2002, a city of Ottawa study disclosed that four properties had identical assessments at a parking building a store, a factory, and a parking lot, the parking lot would pay the lowest property taxes per dollar of evaluation, modestly lower than the apartments, but 35% lower than the store, and 44% below the factory. If you capitalize the tax savings on converting a building to a parking lot, it was the equivalent of a grant worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
something that no heritage program could ever compete against. And the distortions continued. Even in the 1990s, when the feds introduced the GSD, it included what was called a substantial renovation rebate, available to residential projects on condition that at least 90% of the non-structural elements be destroyed. If a developer could be, a developer could be disqualified from the rebate for not producing enough demolition waste. And governments didn't stop there. To this day, they are at least likely to, they, are, they are the least likely to lease rehabbed buildings. Even the heritage officials of the federal and provincial government who speak on behalf of older buildings usually don't work in one. The list is endless. Provincial funding for school boards offered way lower dollars per student per square foot for a rehab school than for demolition and replacement. But the most important side effect was this. The skills for repair and rehab fell into disuse. Training programs on how to fix anything were non-existent. Until the 1990s, not a single architecture school in Canada taught repairs as part of the corporate. Most architects never had a single course in fixing anything. Perhaps more importantly, developers didn't have any exposure to investing in older buildings either. So, government intervention had exactly the predictable result. This was no policy vacuum, at least since 1938. Nothing about this was inadvertent. So, what was the public response? In the age of planned obsolescence, there wasn't any, or at most. In the post-war decades, waste wasn't an issue, sustainability wasn't an issue. Good consumers traded in their car when the ashtrays were full. No one was speaking about reuse or any other sustainability issues back then, but there was one handful of people who didn't want to part with the old stuff, at least not so much then. As long as it had a pedigree or a vintage, this was the heritage community. One of their first major initiatives was in old Montreal. In 1962, the Bichet Commission was mandated by the city to strategize for protection and rehabilitation of a large multi block area. It also helped lead to the adoption of the Quebec Cultural Property Act in 1972, which was a new generation of heritage statute. Almost every province in Canada had had some kind of notional protection for heritage, with statutes often dating back to the 1920s, but they were designed for archaeology and difficult to apply buildings. The Quebec statute divided heritage property between individual properties, districts, and archaeology. For buildings and districts, it created a two-tier system. The province could confer indefinite protection, whereas the municipalities could confer temporary protection. In 1973, a similar two-tier system was adopted by Alberta. Another key factor was in 1972, the treaty from UNESCO. Canada signed the World Heritage Convention in 1976 with Ontario's approval. And although this treaty is best known for recognizing a handful of spectacular sites, World Heritage sites like the Rio Canal or the rest of the Olympic, one key feature was its imposition of legal obligations on member states. The most authoritative international checklist on what's expected from the government heritage policy. As usual for that era, it referred to protection, but that objective wasn't alone. Nor did it take precedence over the other stated objectives, notably to give heritage a function in the life of the community, to take the appropriate legal, administrative, and financial measures necessary for that purpose, and to integrate heritage into comprehensive planning programs. So it's not correct, according to the treaty, that once a property has been protected, the job's over. The job isn't finished until the property has a proper function in the life of the community acknowledged in comprehensive planning programs. That not only means that the planning process is supposed to kick in, it also means that just keeping the building standing isn't good enough. The response in the international heritage community was to pursue conservation a word which in heritage textbooks had long included various kinds of active work, including repair and redacted wing buildings up to code, etc. But the general public didn't necessarily understand that word. Many thought, and still think, 
that conserving heritage is like conserving, conserving food, like shrimp grabbing it or freezing it, or maybe it's like conserving nature.
Oh yeah, and towards the very end, it did say significant world heritage resources and cultural heritage landscapes could be conserved, but that didn't stop a bevy of developers and planners from saying that anything except this was anti-growth, anti-development. Yeah, like heritage is the antithesis of development. It's like the immobilist curse in Harry Potter. It freezes everything where it stands. And that notion wasn't confined to developers. At a conference in Toronto, one of Ontario's most vocal heritage advocates urged lawyers to help save them and heritage from development. Okay? A senior municipal official testified in one of my hearings that heritage properties should be treated as, quote, a no-touch zone. So their theory is that if someone proposes brand new construction, that's growth and development consistent with the PBS. But if someone proposes, or again, hundreds or thousands of owners and crew properties, that's Aside from the museum stuff, my definition of good rehab, I'll do that. Don't tell the construction industry that this is the development. And read the PPS definitions. The PPS even equates certain heritage type projects with intensification, expanding usable floor spaces and intensification. Adaptive reuse projects are an intensification under the name of conversions. They are part of official policy. There's a string of OMB decisions to that effect. But what surprises me, what surprises me the most is that there are still people in the heritage community who can't think of a more compelling response than this. This puts them squarely offside in terms of. Let me read how one community group opened its case in the major of the quote. Balancing economics versus heritage is a fight heritage will rarely win. It is precisely for this reason that the Ontario Heritage Act provides a separate regime from the Planning Act. Ladies and gentlemen, on that argument, they did not win. And my question is, is such self-deprecation either appropriate or necessary? I'm going to skip more of my stuff. 2005, you've already heard, it, heard about it. And I'm going to jump ahead to the National Building Code in 2005. And that is that for the first time there was what was called an objective based code. And this was the first major breakthrough of money. And that was where it became suddenly much more flexible in terms of being able to invoke the National Building Code to be able to do appropriate things for older buildings. The new code was structured so that it would outline the intent of each national, of each provision at the front of the provision. It would then provide examples of how that provision could be met, and then it would specify that if you had an alternative way of meeting the same objective, you were in, in the good. Now, I'm going to also jump ahead I'm going to skip for now what is happening right now in terms of the reorganization of my beloved body, the Ontario Municipal Board, which is now becoming LPAT, the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal. And if there are questions about that later, um, then fine. But the most important thing at this point is to recap. Here are my three points. There was no policy vacuum, at least not since W.C. Clark 80 years ago. We're witnessing the legacy of hostile and systematic governmental intervention promoting demolition on multiplicity of fronts. Those interventions are sometimes being undone, but only gradually. I learned just this morning that 15 years after Ottawa identified the preferential treatment that parking lots get under its property tax system, those incentives for parking lots are still there. Finally, Ontario's policy framework is pro-development. But so are we. Heritage is not about arresting development. It involves a significant branch of the construction industry. 
and let no one be misled about the importance this has for real estate investment and the GDP. Those are the current policy, that is the current policy parameters for heritage. It is the quintessential sustainable development in an urban environment. And the phrase attributed to Henry this year, that is not only our policy, it has the added advantage of being the truth. And those, ladies and gentlemen, are my three points. If you want more, I have business cards, and you can buy my books. I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, certainly the other speakers will be filling in some of the points that you've just heard. Um, I'm very pleased that you've had that context though, because these are some of the key things that often heritage advocates and heritage uh, professionals either get tripped up on or are having to explain. So with that, I'll introduce Zach, and you're going to fill in the blanks on our challenge. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. Good. Thank you. Um, and archaeology, in, in the case of my talk, 
is defined broadly according to excavation, documentation, and collection of uh, human artifactual remains, as opposed to antiquarianism, which is essentially the collection and uh, sometimes abstract organization of curios, which can include everything from beaver skulls to Renaissance sketches, often intersecting to extreme degrees uh, with the natural world, like geology, you know, rock collections. So those are just some basic definitions uh, to keep in your head when I'm talking about these things. So uh, Ontario's late 19th and early 20th centuries saw a relatively powerful surge and continual growth in popular interest when it came to the past. This included pre-European history, heritage, archaeology, and probably most importantly artifacts in this case. People can find objects of some sort of antiquity in, in Canadian fields as long as there have been European style agriculture, and probably before that as well, with the First Nations. So, though interest in the organization of curious objects had been a component of modernity since the period's inception, that is, after the medieval period, the late 19th and early 20th centuries saw the practice in Canada morph into a distinct and highly modern <coughs> discipline with corresponding modern approaches and values. Archaeology as a discipline found its historical roots in Europe's early amateur antiquarianism. Uh, that's between the, 19th, or the 17th and 19th centuries. But its historical ascendancy as such, as well as heritage preservation, especially in Britain and North America, are far more than made of the 19th century. Modernity, in many respects, found its apex in that century, uh, along with the development of professional special specialization. Uh, in this case, sort of, um, sort of applied academic division of labor is what I call it. This broad phenomenon, of course, affected most forms of knowledge and business of knowledge as well. This period of historical and rapid modernization saw natural history, often the domain of antiquarian societies, break and reform in a very modern way into. Uh, several applied scientists, first, probably the first of which was geology, which began to challenge the traditional conception of the young earth um, with biology um, close at hand, and its, con on its contestations to creationism closely on uh, geology fields within a few decades of each other. This deconstruction and construction of identities had consequences, um, and one of the primary uh, people I, I looked at their work was the Thomas at the University of Manchester, who pointed out that modern had already begun to see nature in the Cartesian sense centuries earlier, previous to the 19th century, as a machine with fixed parts that could be studied rather than a living organism made complete to cope with. Indeed, the idea of sciences of society came about at precisely the point when modernity began to gain coherency. Thomas found this point as being in the context of Descartes' influence on Hobbes via his mechanical, mechanical conception of society as made with various parts, like a machine. With regards to the background of archaeology and heritage preservation, this all relates to taxonomic schemes first used in ordering living things, but not, not long after also used in ordering libraries, archives, and data in general. Artifacts join this list as antiquarianism with its close relation to natural history became influenced in similar ways. As sciences such as geology and biology developed as disciplines, antiquarianism, mostly made up of these taxonomic schemes of collecting, began to seek the discovery of hidden uh, material and heritage in an organizable, presentable, and useful fashion. The usefulness is key in, um, in the framework of modernity, because that's just how people thought, you know, value correlates to useful. So, the scientific methods of the 19th century made antiquarianism's transitions toward archaeology possible. As the discipline became methodical, and archaeologists began the technicians of nature's machine. Archaeologists could provide otherwise hidden data to reveal the moving parts of the world to historians, ethnologists, and all manner of other academic professionals in what was seen, at the very least, to be a useful per pursuit of information. This is made evident in the case of museums, which in fact legitimized information collection. Many cases show developments of collections this way as an attempt to manifest uh, a classificatory, classificatory table, thus prioritizing the description over meaning as opposed to something like a curio cabinet, which was popular up until mid to late 19th century.
and even, I mean, you can still see them today in people's living rooms and things, you know, private collections. So, by moving art artifacts from cabinets and cur curiosities to modern public institutions in the theater of Europe, and uh, specifically Denmark initially in the 18th century, archaeology began to take its most essential modern form as a discipline intimately connected with time, identity, and the objectification of history. Curators and archaeologists connected the past with stratigraphic debt, whereby the only source of worthy knowledge must be, as Thomas says in Archaeology and Modernity, brought from the darkness. This is the conflation of the past with death and truth, as well as the preoccupation with time one finds in modernized societies. Uh, outside of Thomas' general and highly theoretical work, one would find very little in the way of full-length analysis regarding archaeology and modernity. Archaeologists don't t tend to talk about themselves very much. They focus on field work, lab work, and the science of archaeology, and very few are self-reflective on the discipline itself. So this is in fact, or in itself, baffling because of the inextricable historical ties that the development of modernity and archaeology share with one another. These ties are only, and not explicitly, uh, explored in some work in the field of nationalism and the nation state, both in and of themselves very modernist concepts. Archaeology in a lot of ways tied itself to nationalism in, uh, as, as nationalism rose to be a, a serious ideology in the 19th and 20th centuries. The relationships between nationalism and archaeology have been thoroughly investigated in, uh, in several works. I'm not going to listen here, so let's get through that quick. <laughs> While this, uh, but, but what's important to know is that scholars have generally failed to view the history of archaeology through any real lens of modernity. While this failure certainly applies to the history of archaeology at large, um, Thomas, once again, analyzed the general development of archaeology under the umbrella of modernity and modern principles. And, in fact, the book Archaeology and Modernity operated more as a history of modernity in an archaeology vein than actually looking at archaeology itself. So, another thing to take away is that To narrow the field of modernist vision, these works focus on, um, or I, I take the framework from, from these authors and uh, the research in the archives, and I focus on Ontario, with its relatively highly developed institutions, collections, and its first professional archaeologists. Um, and importantly, this focus that I've done in my paper revolves around several key items in the history of early Canadian archaeology. So, we're going to skip over the primary sources. Well, quickly, um, I looked at primary sources like the original charter of the World Canadian Institute, and I critically analyzed that and Sanford Fleming's involvement with uh, the origins of archaeology as development, in fact, as Mark was speaking. A lot of it ties back to development. Sanford Fleming himself was an engineer. He built the railroads and whatnot, and he was also, you know, interested in archaeology. Daniel Wilson, who came from Scotland, and in a lot of ways um, brought archaeological theory to the English language, <coughs> became a Canadian. Andrew F. Hunter, who is uh, Canada's first steel archaeologist, as far as I'm able to tell him anyway, and David Boyle, who uh, modernized collections in Canada. These are all 19th century and very early 20th century authors. So the primary thesis I get to is that in the context of this rapidly modernizing 19th century, Canada, specifically Ontario, um, there was a, an increase in interest in the, in the objectification, care for the contact, history, and heritage. Especially in a professional organized sense where money started to flow. As Mark said, you can always track the money. So these disciplines began to find their, their funding. Uh, David Boyle was very influential in that, in gathering the money needed to do things like build cabinets and exhibits and uh, secure facilities like the ROM, uh, which is the descendant of the Royal Canadian Institute. So, um, in the interest of time, we'll, uh, we'll cut through some of that analysis, but that's, that's primarily the idea, aside from introduction, which is uh, the framework I use. That's the idea that my paper's about. I'm more than willing to disseminate. So if anyone's interested in reading it, since we're a bit part of the time here, uh, I can afford it. But a quick aside to research moving forward, 
or I'll quickly, uh, there was a search interest, several new institutions in Canada, and specifically Ontario, but also uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Manitoba, all started to, these institutions started to spring up and start to regulate and promote archaeology and heritage preparation. But there were also key players, um, and the industry was very limited early on, and David Boyle played a huge <coughs> part. Not going to go much deeper than that. <laughs> uh, so moving forward, there's a lot of work to be done. And the, my analysis is admittedly pretty Eurocentric. Um, in, in the interest of uh, space I had to write a paper in, and the amount of uh, funding I had to go about doing archival research, I had to pick certain themes to focus on. So, in terms of the field, there's been a general lack of exploration, academic and otherwise. And uh, even the individuals I focus on, you could probably write whole papers and present whole talks on each individual alone because of their involvement with the heritage industry, early material heritage in Canada, and archaeology. Um, there are also many other individuals left buried and hidden, as uh, Marcus Turner will talk about today in the later 20th century, for example. You saw some of Canada's pioneering archaeologists that really changed things up. And uh, people who began to, to revolutionize the heritage industry in, in a more earnest sense. So there are many people to, to still round up and talk about research-wise. And for my talk and my paper, it has a limited breadth. So there's lots of opportunities for expansion. And there are there are very few secondary sources. So it's a, it's a great avenue for, for pursuing archival research because these things have remained largely ignored in Canadian studies. But I'll have my talk there anyway. And I guess, I don't know, do I have time for a few questions? Any mm -hmm. questions at the end? At the end? Okay, yeah. great, perfect. Thank you very much. Basically, what I'm going to talk about is the history of 
federal heritage. Um, I used to work for Parks Canada for, for many, many years, and, uh, and I want to give you sort of a quick synopsis of, of the, the history of federal heritage, okay? And essentially I'm going to make five points, quick points for you to take with you, which is um, today there is still essentially, after all these initiatives that I'll talk about, there is still uh, no federal legislation, no real federal legislation. Uh, this is um, what I'm going to point out is that this has been an, uh, an exercise that's been going on for a, a century, essentially. Uh, second of all, that we start with colonial models. We start with imperialist models in this country. Uh, we take it, we turn to Britain in the early years. And then um, by the post-war period, we turn to uh, models in the U.S. And then finally, uh, after that shift in the 60s and 70s, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this in your career, then there is a new initiative, and I'll talk briefly about recent initiatives in the last 20 years or so, and then finally sort of the existing situation today at the federal level. So I'm not going to talk about uh, Ontario per se, okay? Uh, I'm going to jump over quickly. You know the concept. Uh, I know Mark went from the Roman times right up to today, but I don't need to do that. I can just say it's essentially a, a relationship which, with, between sustainability, as we know today. It's a relationship with what happened in the 19th century, the, or the modern period, the industrialization of the world, and that the, the, the situation we are in today, which is essentially that we're burning a lot of fossil fuels, and if we don't change anything, if we don't change our behavior, this is an impact, right? So it's a very basic question. All of those people from Ruskin to about the other Duke, about all of the people that take these initiatives, they're essentially addressing industrial revolution and um, and the issue of us being able to sustain ourselves on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Historic Sites and Monuments for Canada. I mean, everyone knows the HSNBC, right? 
all very familiar with national historic sites and their designation process. The key idea behind this is that this is really, uh, it takes some of the members of the Historic Landmarks Association and they get appointed to the board under uh, this fellow right here, Brigadier General Cookshank. And if you know Cookshank, he was the head of the board for about 20 years. He was, uh, they were all, interestingly enough, amateur historians. They weren't uh, professional historians, not academic historians. They would eventually start to appoint academic historians, but these people are all amateur historians. Most of their interest in good Canadian, mostly English Canada, there were some, some Francophone members, but basically they're going to commemorate what happened in, in 1912, the centennial of the war making off. So essentially, all your first designations are all about battle sites, forts. You've all been to probably a fort on the uh, down in Niagara on the lake, something like that. Um, the intention was to commemorate essentially a collective memory of identity in Canada. That whole idea of collective memory of creating a Canada. There were some, some Francophone commemorations in the early days, not that many. Uh, it's, it's essentially imperial white men doing this. They're all men. What's interesting in terms of the, the concept of what's happening here is that they're commemorating. They're not conserving. And that's a whole different, I think you, you know, they'll touch upon that. But really, this is a very strategic way to commemorate without the implication of paying for concert. So they go around, and you've all seen them, they're large cairns, probably with old bronze plaques, the burgundy bronze plaques. Why I have the green around this fellow is, this is the lawyer of the group. His name is uh, uh, Poyne. Um, the reason I, I highlight him is because in 1919, when they set up this uh, board, they, Harkett, who runs the, the historic branch, parks branch, the Dominion Parks branch in, in the federal government, they try to enact legislation. In 1919, there is a proposal for a legislation called the Dominion Parks and Historic Sites Act, which essentially granted strong powers, temporary preservation orders to seize control of heritage structures. I mean, this was far reaching. This is what they were going to try to do, what was happening in England and, and not so much in the U.S. yet, but essentially what was happening in Britain. That never goes to Parliament. So we've never had legislation, but this was being thought about in 1919. What did they pursue over the next, I'm going to jump many decades here, they pursue the commemoration of a narrative of Canadian history that you, well, none of you, but a certain generation would have read in, in, in grade school and high school, right? It's the commemoration of the fur trade, it's about Guinness and its staples theory. It's all of these ideas, right? So it's all commemorative. The only thing is, is that, as the Toronto Star said, the one big thing, or the one big thing tourist people seem to overlook is that folks on holiday hunger for side attractions, things historical should be identified by something more than fieldstone cairns erected along the highway. And it's <laughs> Service took on. 
because the National Park Service in the U.S. is very similar. It's a similar history to the Canadian Park Service. It's parks and historic sites. We never separated them. We didn't have private organizations and so on. So it's a similar, uh, and there is more cross-fertilization between the two organizations. Um, the reason I, I, I mean, I have a lot of words up there, but key ones are things like the reconstruction of the new pool, right? Um, the creation of the Canadian Register of Historic Places. Uh, sorry, the, 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 um, the Canadian Inventory of Historic Places in 1970. I've also marked, uh, and Mark also mentioned it, the World Heritage Convention. That really keys in the legal consequences, right? Now they're starting to think of legal versus commemorative. Um, Heritage Canada Foundation, right? Essentially set up by the federal government. It wasn't, it was the federal government that endowed the money and Kitsian gave the money to create a foundation, which happened in the US too. But here, that's how it was set up. It wasn't a, a private fund of any sort. Um, Heritage Protections Railway Act, Maurice Strong, who's, who's a leading Canadian. And so this whole, um, this whole awareness comes about in the 60s and 70s. Um, five. Yeah, perfect. I can do that. The Federal Advisory and Coordinating Committee on Heritage Conservation, this, this committee at the federal level, they're very important. They're very important because out of their cabinet uh, recommendations is everything that we would wish for at the federal level, which is the tax incentive, the uh, regulations, the uh, Canadian Register, the uh, Standards and Guidelines, all of this is discussed in Cabinet in 1979. And, and it's Hugh Faulkner, who, who was the, uh, the, the minister at the time, who basically says, so all of the stuff that comes next in, our, in our, my concise history really starts in the late 1970s. That's when things are being really discussed. Um, in the 80s, 90s, and noughts, it shifts a bit. It, it now becomes, a, uh, at the federal level, about public engagement. Rather than the old stodgy board decisions, it's now about public engagement and getting people to nominate places, getting people to look at um, uh, areas under a system plan that weren't being paid attention, attention to. We had a whole history of boards and fur trade sites and, and architectural designations, but we had not done black history women's history, cultural communities, indigenous issues. This all comes to head in the 1990s. And it's especially, everyone knows him, Tom Simons, who's the chair of the board. And Tom Simons, who I think is being recognized you know, now at, at, at different conferences for his, his, his influence, but I think he's actually very, very influential, because he's the first person to start opening up and saying, Let's engage with the Canadian. Let's, let's not just be behind closed doors and at a board. Very key, important person. Uh, the other thing is that there's, in fact, this, in fact, the whole federal heritage program in the government would have been dissolved under a famous, I don't know if you guys remember, the Canada's Green Plan. The Green Plan it was a, just before the Conservatives left government they had the Green Plan. Well, in the cabinet affairs decisions for that, they were going to dismantle and sell off everything, all national historic sites. And fortunately, with the uh, creation or the restructuring of government, they created the, the Department of Canadian <coughs> Heritage, and, and fortunately it was safe. Um, out of, by the end of the decade, there are, um, there are the ideas from the 1970s that become what is called the uh, Historic Places Initiative. So the Historic Places Initiative exist because really those decisions that were made in the 70s, by the time the funding comes in in the late 90s, we have the Historic Places Initiative, which all of you probably in your careers have had an impact. I used to be the Canadian Registrar when I was with the government that managed the Canadian Register of Historic Places. We had the standards and guidelines for both. We tried to do commercial heritage incentives. And it was all based on an argument with the federal <coughs> government that in fact Canada, you can see this very well, but essentially, we were behind the times. We could talk the talk, but we couldn't walk the walk at the federal level. We still can. Um, okay, so the summary. Uh, some things were a success. We had the standards and guidelines. We had the Canadian Register. Some of the aspects of the initiative never worked. The, 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 the conservative government sunset the program. The conservative government did not want uh, to continue it. But there were a lot of benefits out of it, a lot of interaction between 
federal and provincial levels. Uh, there is standardization of practice. We have more interest by the private sector and a stronger network between the jurisdictions. And lastly, so what do we have as our situation today? Um, someone jokingly said, oh, I, what was it you were saying? I heard about a lot of people leaving parts. <laughs> well, partly because the leadership within the government has, has also changed. And, and, and now uh, much of what the initiative is at the federal level right now is really issues-based and celebrations. So it's a lot more experience and event than actual building of the policy. This is, this is the vacuum. This is why I can speak here, because uh, I do not work for the federal government anymore. So I can tell you that, in fact, there is a major vacuum there. I know you talk about no policy vacuum, but for, the fact is, is that the initiative was there, and it died. We're hoping that we can, we can bring it back. Um, there's also a, a loss of leadership in the federal government, too. So I think, I think that's something that, that all of you as citizens can write your MPs and we can try to change that. Hopefully, we can end up with some historic places legislation, something that enshrines designations in legal terms, uh, that there are more authority at the federal level, and that it's about sustainability, and it's about that, building that relationship again. Um, that is the most concise, I think, um, history of the federal designations that I've done. Wonderful. That's it.